So here, here's, here we'll start off with that. I start, I start every class I teach. And we, we, we're just apologizing ahead of time. And I, and I we're allowing Dave to do this because we're killing a little time while other people get up here, but you know, enjoy I'll the dad explain, jokes. I'll actually explain why. And they're bad. I will tell you. Okay, so first one. Why can't cows wear sandals? They lack toes. Uh, <laughs> but don't bump. No, oh, it gets better. <laughs> actually, it gets worse. What does shirt say to the pants? What's up, Riches? Now, the honest the reason I used to do that, when I, I taught I taught St. Augustine uh, High School, I taught a class up there. And when I went to the classroom, I came from industry. Where, this is just inside. I came from I came from industry, so I have no teaching experience. And my wife, my kids looked at me, especially my kids, who are now like grown, they looked at me and went, You're gonna teach in high school? I was like, Yeah. You go, wait a second. You're going to teach high school. You raised us. Don't do that to me. <laughs> so, what I did was, I was like, okay, I can't go in there and command a war for So, I was like, okay. Oh. I had to show my soft underwear. I do have very soft underwear. <laughs> but that, what that does is, when I show kids how stupid I could be up there with these dad jokes, you know what that did? Totally disarmed. And they would, they would grow. I mean, I've had some of the worst jokes. Where like, oh my God, Professor Morfield, it's hard. I'm like, oh, are you saying I have no charisma? But at, when the class began, those guys and yeah, were phenomenal. They were just like, they were locked on. They knew it was going to be a fun class. They enjoyed it. But it showed them vulnerability. And that's one of the things that I, that I took away from that. I was like, oh, that was a cool experiment. When you show your vulnerability to them, they're going to show it to you. And that was really a huge take. Just, just inside. Work for me. Give it a shot. If not, wait. There you go. See, there's schools. We went to uh, Atlantic High School, one of the schools we went to, and the uh, principal, I was telling him what happened, and he would every morning now tell dad jokes. Oh, please, don't, that's a lot of pressure on me. I told you It's good, though. It's fun. I know. <laughs> That's the point, they're not supposed to be fun. Okay. Do you think we They said to give us, give everybody about five, ten minutes after? Oh. I think that'd be more bad. You all get straight right here. You might not have any for that. I'll do it. All right, I got one. Here's a good one. Just, just, what do you get when you cross an elephant or a rhino? Yeah, we're going to try. Yeah, we're going to try. Elephant, that's a good one. <laughs> elephant. And again, this is what's in the borderline where it's just almost not a dad joke. Kids just okay. have to like, oh, that's funny because it's almost not a dad joke. We're going to go ahead and get started. Because um, we've got a full presentation for you today, and then we are going to open it up for questions and conversations at the end. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Colleen Conklin. I'm the Executive Director of the Gates Aerospace Institute at Henry Riddle Aeronautical University. And I've got our Director of Education Programs, Kate Barnett, and our Director of Flight, Manned, and Unmanned, Dave Moorfield. Papa, Papa Jokes. That shows um, and really what we wanted to present today is kind of a solution that we're proposing at, to a very complex problem. And obviously that is feeding this pipeline. Um, a lot of folks think that this is all about recruitment, and we are here to tell you it's not. It's about preparing those students, prov providing them with access and exposure to all of these opportunities in aviation. So in the state of Florida, we're very, very fortunate. We have been given a $3 million grant year after year to do exactly that. Last year, we serviced about 150 schools. We also provide programming outside of the state of Florida. We reached about 8,800 students last year. About 3,000 of them were dual enrolled students. So the vision for our program Again, as I said, was to present this as a solution to the workforce shortage we're facing in aviation. Um, and it's to be recognized worldwide for excellence in aviation education. Our mission is really about 
positively um, impacting that trajectory for students. So we, we heard a little bit from Eric this morning about changing um, generational poverty. And we believe that careers in aviation can do that significantly. But a lot of times, we all know we're preaching to the choir, students just don't have access to these types of opportunities. Very quick story, one of my favorites, especially when we're looking at in recruiting young women into aviation. Um, students often, when they're looking for a letter of recommendation, they'll come by the office. Uh, we do have a number that go on to every riddle. Um, came by the office, and there was a young lady, and she's asking for a letter of recommendation for Southwest. And so I always send the kid to the students down and say, tell me your story. I want to know about your story. And she went to St. Augustine High School before Papa was there. Um, and she actually was placed by accident in a private pilot ground school. She thought she had signed up for cosmetology. <laughs> True story. But she walked in, and it was all young men. She was the only female. And she immediately knew, this isn't cosmetology. <laughs> um, so she told the teacher, the teacher went down to guidance, any of you in a high school, you know, students are not getting their schedule changed immediately. So the guidance counselor said, sit tight, hang out, we'll work on changing your schedule. So about two weeks go by, which is about average, you're gonna have a schedule change. Guidance counselor comes down, we got your schedule straightened out, and she's like, well, I kind of think I like this aviation thing. I didn't think I could do it, but I'm actually pretty good. So I think I'm gonna stay. She ended up getting her private pilot license before she graduated high school. And here we were writing a letter of recommendation for her, she networks for Southwest. And it was happenstance in her circumstance. Happenstance, total luck. But oftentimes, many of our programs, we work with a lot of Title I schools. Those students would never, ever, just like many of you, they never would have had exposure to those opportunities, to know the art of the impossible. So we commend all of you for doing what you're doing, regardless of how you're getting there, because it's gonna take a village to meet this need. So um, we're gonna share with you uh, Dave is going to share a little bit about industry needs. Kate's going to go into some of the details about our program specifically. We'll wrap it up at the end with some of what we do in addition to dual enrollment, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay? Uh, no, no more dad jokes. No, no more dad jokes, I promise. Um, I'm going to just start throwing some tomatoes in there. So like, like Kelly said, call sign pop-up, prior day with the year. Um, the issue, I, mean, I, I will go back to this a little bit. I was a flight instructor, and I told somebody this story earlier. I was a flight instructor in 19, 1995 and 1999 in BT2. That's the uh, training squadron for the Navy. And at that time, a lot of the folks that I was with had decided they're not going to continue off the Navy career, they're going to go into the Air Force. And so they came out of the, you know, the house of flying drones, and they were the What's the airlines? So when they got to the airlines, when they were lucky, remember this, when they were lucky enough to get an interview to go to, when they got to the airline, the airline told them, you're going to be a first officer for between 10 and 15 years. Does anybody know what the first officer upgrade is today? Success. I saw, I've heard six, nine months, there's some years, two years. Two Years. That's how much it has dropped. And we were just talking to somebody from America, I think it was two or three weeks ago, and they said they lose over 50% of their pilots to retirements in the next seven years. That's just, that's just retirements. That is not people who are going to medically come out, people who find other jobs, people who just sit there with their families. That's just retirements. That's where the needs are. This, this is, you know, some of the recent numbers from Moe. So the need is staggering. It's not just pilots. I think some of the news were earlier today. We're talking engineers, mechanics, um, designers. It's across the board. And the aviation issue is growing. There's a chart here we'll get to in a minute. It talks about the growth of the airplanes and how many we're going to have. But if you look at the actual number of pilots, that remains pretty flat, which is pretty staggering. So in the next five years, the storm is coming.
Everybody said, I am tired of doing my house, I want to travel, okay? And then the airlines went to all stop. Well, why did that happen? Well, what happened was, after when COVID hit, a lot of the airlines said, oh, we can get rid of a lot of our pilots by giving early retirements, because the airline industry thought, you know what, this is gonna be around for a while. They didn't, re they didn't account for the bounce back in the aviation industry. And right now, that exasperated the problem they already had. It's gonna be worse. Okay, we made it worse because of a lot of pilots are like, I knew that earlier? Oh, I'm gone. Okay, next. Right, again, look at this. Your mainline usual carriers. If you look at the growth, okay, that's going to be expanded. That's going to be growth. That's huge. It's almost going to double by 2020, by 2022 to 2042. It's almost a doubling in the amount of people who are in your carrier. Next. Okay. Again, carrier fleet, the fleet's going to grow. This is the one that's this is the one that's very telling. From 2012 to 2042, okay, active pilots by type of certification. Look at the ATP pilots. It's a little bit of growth, but we're pretty steadily at about 450 to 480. And it stays up. But yet we're going to double the growth of people who are getting fun. <coughs> the potential is out there. We've got to get these kids excited for that. Okay? And again, this isn't just pilots. This is maintainers, it's designers, it's engineers, it's everybody that we have flying in the industry right now. Okay, next. <clears throat> Our unmanned aircraft systems. Go ahead. Okay, more than 620,000 personal US registered in 2016. The big takeaway from this is the drone issues, the drone issues grow. Now, one of the things that we've talked about, we talk about with our students quite often is, well, do I have to be a pilot? Well, it kind of depends. Okay. When we start looking at passenger carrying drones, the FAA has said for the first five years, there's going to be a pilot in that drone. Okay. They're going to be a certified pilot. Eventually, they're going to take that pilot out. But you're probably still going to be a pilot because the FAA is not going to go, oh, okay, well, you can carry passengers. You've got Part 107, you're good. Now, for carrying, for carrying packages, Part 107 is going to be tipped. But that's going to grow exponentially. There are companies right now, Vertiport in uh, Florida, they're building a vertical port to take passengers from that vertical port to the airports. And it's going to happen in the next five years. So the future is here. This generation is the Jesse's future. The registration versus effective active fleet models here with new registrations in that game. Same kind of flat, but I mean, if you look at the new registrations, we're on an upslope. Market based portion for UAS. We keep doubling and doubling. Okay? One of the biggest hurdles with UAS, though, Okay, you guys just came from the FAA, right? The FAA lecture? How, how fast is the FAA move? The speed is snail. Okay. That's how the FAA moves. The FAA right now is having a hard time catching up with the demand for UAS because they're going, I, I don't know how to do it. Right? There's a lot of ideas in how they're going to do it, but they're really looking at the industry and go, okay, what do you guys want to do and how do you do it? It's a little bit like how the airline industry was in the infancy. Okay? The FAA or CAA back in that day. Look at the issue now. Okay, well, what do we need to do? How do we need to figure this out? And they really a lot of new shit. Well, it's kind of the same model we're using here. It hasn't changed all that much. Next. Of course, the fusions uh, submitted with drone proof. Okay, just talking about what kind of operations we do. Uh, night operations beyond visual line of sight operations, operations for moving vehicles, over people and limited uh, operation limitations. So there's a lot been submitted. Some withdrawn, and look at the number that were approved. Very, very, very few approved. Okay, night operations have been growing, but the rest of that, and why is that? Because the FAA's like, I, I don't know how to do it. You don't know. Okay. All right, so where, where is the issue growing with drones? Well, if you look, this, this is a great example. Air photography, real estate, aerial inspection. Aerial survey, construction, infrastructure, agriculture, agriculture, and filming. So anything that used to require helicopter, which you know, so mm -hmm. made, anything that used to require helicopters now being done by a drone, which makes sense, right? You don't have to pay a pilot 
thousands of dollars and have an aircraft that costs you thousands of dollars an hour to use, you can do it with the drone. All right? So that's where we're going with the drone issue. One of the questions is, well, why, why would you want to start teaching drones in high school if you're trying to get people interested in English and English? Why would that be? Well, think about everything that they learn as drone pilots. It goes across the board. They have to learn about airspace. They have to learn about weather. They have to learn about weight and balance. Okay? Those things are, they transcend the drone industry into man aviation industry. And oh, by the way, for a high school student to walk away and tell his parents, hey, I got an F-107 license, I got an FAA license. They walk away and they're like, well, that's pretty cool. Well, what else can I do? Colleen said it before, we call it the art of the possible. We just gave a kid the art of the possible. They went, well, if I can do that, can I do that? Sure, can. Not a problem. You can do it. And that's what we're here to do. That's it. Here's some of the careers. Consultants up to $120,000. US pilot, $79,000, $139,000, $131,000. Instructors, analysts, UA systems engineers, data specialists, on and on and on. So a lot of these industries are pulling these kids on board. I was just talking to one of our regional managers. He, he had a, a young man who got his drone license with us. He's just got a job off of which growing up, and he's going to be making about $60,000 a year. Okay. So there is stuff out there. It's growing. It's growing by leaps and bounds. But a lot of people are going to be back. I will turn it over to Kate. <laughs> I will not do dad jokes. So I come from secondary. I was a people CTV director in my previous life. And um, I have built programs, um, CTE programs. So it was, to a certain extent, coming home to come to Embry-Riddle and work with Dr. Conklin and Dave on building this program. What we do as a solution to the desperate need that we have in the aviation industry, and as Dr. Conklin and Dave has said, it's all across the board. We all know that. So what we do, we are not admissions, we are not recruitment, we are gates. And our mission is to spread the STEM gospel and increase the interest of students in the aviation field and to develop their integrated uh, skills, apply, the application of math, the application of language arts skills, communications, all the soft skills that are desperately needed regardless of what industry you're in. So the tracks that we have, we have aviation and flight, unmanned aircraft systems, aviation maintenance, which is, there's a great need. We have a lot of schools that are very interested in maintenance. Commercial space operations, we have some exciting movement there. Engineering and aviation business. So the benefits for students. They graduate with up to 18 credits, depending on the school, depending on the track which is a savings of over $28,000. They have college credit that they can take to any university or anywhere as a level of credit. And they are exposed to what's available, the art of the possible, across the industry. And hopefully that ignition of interest in aerospace. We have industry certifications that are embedded in our programs. So as Dave was saying, a student can graduate with a private pilot ground uh, for small UAS, Part 107, or visual uh, VSO. For the school, in Florida, we are part of the acceleration mechanism. So by offering the dual enrollment, you're giving that opportunity for students to not have to leave their high school campus because we are embedded in their schedule, so again, taking away barriers for them to access accelerated programs. We provide through the grant, uh, if the school does not have local talent on their campus, an adjunct professor. And we see that for up to two years. Hopefully, by that time, the school is able to uh, carry over with theirs. And we only require a 2.5 GPA. So again, it's about bringing down barriers for students to access accelerated curriculum. So we have a couple of different models. One, as I said before, the school has talent on their campus that we can credential. That reduces the cost and provides sustainability for the high school 
to carry through. The second model is that we provide the adjunct through the grant and are able to see the program to get off the ground. So when we credential instructors, it is just as if they are coming to Daytona Beach or Prescott campus, they have to have a master's degree. The degree can be in field, and if it is not, there's other training requirements that we uh, provide support for to get them across that hurdle. If they come from military, they're DD 214 and any other industry certifications that they may need to credential. We provide paperwork to the individual colleges depending on where the school would like to, what program the school would like to provide, and we get that credentialing done through the college on campus. So this is a suggested pathway for sustainability. We have just recently opened uh, an eighth grade course. So what we have a huge demand for is that feeding program and being CTE and the changes that have occurred in Perkins over the past four years that line of sight between middle school and high school to post-secondary to uh, industry. So the eighth grade course has been growing rapidly. We got to have much demand for that. Then we do have a ninth grade feeder. So when they get to high school, they don't have to wait till 10th grade to be part of the program. We have a base camp for them to land in and then develop their interests. And then these are some typical, uh, you know, Pretty general, typical patterns of offering on the dual enrollment. So we have a very robust program. What we do is we provide the training, we get the instructor credential, they come to campus, we provide boot camp training to make sure that they are comfortable and up to speed with regards to what they're teaching. The level of support that our program provides is unparalleled. Again, they are uh, the courses we are built into the student schedule. So again, bringing down the barriers to make a uh, program successful. We also have another series of uh, opportunities, and I'll let. So in addition to the dual enrollment, many of the requests we were getting were from high schools and passionate uh, teachers with an aviation background, but they didn't have the master's degree. They didn't meet the criteria, but they wanted to offer their students the opportunity. So several years ago, gosh, I think maybe six or seven years ago, we started to develop high school credit courses. And also now, like Kate was mentioning, we have middle school, we're fully developing the seventh and sixth grade, Piece. And now, of course, what do you think the next request is? Elementary feeders are requesting, hey, do you have elementary curriculum? So your question hit home this morning when you asked it. But advanced secondary coursework that we have developed for just high school for, again, teachers who don't meet the criteria for the dual enrollment components is private pilot ground school, unmanned aircraft systems, part 107, we have an um, FFA, AgriSci course, um, Aviation Algebra, which is really for those, because I was that kid, right? Why do I need to know this? Um, and one of our professors on campus, we developed an Aviation Algebra, basically embedding algebra into um, everything aviation related, if you will. We've got an Aviation Tech Design, which is a Fusion 360 course where we work with industry partners, where they actually design um, airfoils and winglets and all sorts of stuff. Uh, robotics and then an intro to space, because of course being in Florida, right, very much a, a request again. All of that really was born out of the request from secondary um, and middle school administrators and teachers. And so that is one of our fastest growing opportunities. Some of the benefits of that our, we train our teachers as though they were teaching a college level course. So we have an annual conference every year in the fall. Last year we had about 250 educators and CTE directors and administrators, guidance counselors. Um, and we train them just as though they were going into the classroom. Um, along with that, we've got the middle school feeder and then also um, other curriculum opportunities. Most of our courses, almost all of our courses, but not all, 
have industry certifications built into them. If you're familiar with USI, we use USI for unmanned safety certifications. Um, some of the outreach opportunities, we do a lot with Seaperch. Are any of you familiar with Seaperch? A super cool program. It's an underwater robotics program. Uh, it's sponsored through the Navy, but um, the students love it. Um, so we, we do a good bit with that. They have regional competitions, state competitions, and then international competitions. And could you go back one, one more second? I don't know why it's missing from the slide, but one of the other outreaches that we do have, we have a lot of competitions. So each year we have something called the Drone Olympics. And in the Drone Olympics, students compete in a swarm competition where they have to choreograph a small fleet of drones. They have to do an obstacle course, a timed obstacle course, and they also have to do a, um, oh, a race. Okay, how could I forget? And drone tank, the final one is drone tank. They have to design and present a drone for the greater good of their local community. What would they use that drone for? It's very similar to future problem solvers, if anybody's familiar with that. And then finally, the desired outcomes we have are, I'm sure, the same desired outcomes that you have, right? So for our students, it's real STEM competency. It's not about learning something that's abstract. It's about learning something that is relevant, that they can see how they can utilize it in their own lives. And like we mentioned, the art of the, the impossible or possible. Uh, it's collaborative. We really try to use project-based learning and labs, a lot of hands-on. Um, Redbird is great. Most of our classrooms have simulators. We're doing a lot right now with VR. And the idea is, again, is to just expose, 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 expose them. This is our webpage. This is our webpage. Um, and the other stuff is, for the educators, it's, it's relative, right? And for the business community and the workforce, it's clear what the, the outcome is. And that's to feed the pipeline. So we're just going to wrap it up. This is our website. And we have, it's a very short, it's a four minute video. It's highlighting the females that have gone through our program. And we had our very first doctoral student graduate. And she's highlighted in this video. So any moment we have to share her story and some of the other uh, young ladies, we'd like to do that. I am Dr. Colin we provide high school students full enrollment opportunities, which are our courses and classes exactly at what they are also on campus in the students in the careers in STEM and aviation exposure programs like this, specific for because you need to know the students to go in and do action. We have a very low number as far as females in aviation right now. In the industry, it's kind of flat on throughout our history, actually. So we need diversity in all aspects of aviation because it will help your organization grow. And for the future of all of us, I think that innovation would require more diversity. My name is Fabiola Gordo Acevedo, I'm from Vistas High School and I'm part of the Gates Aerospace Institute. Through Gates Aerospace, I was able to earn a scholarship opportunity I'm going to earn my private science license during the summer. I've always wanted to go to college, but after taking the dual remote courses, it's opened me up to more opportunities. I did not think I was going to get that scholarship. I never even thought that I was going to go to college. I'm Amber Avery Paul. I'm in the Human Factors program here at Avery Riddle, and currently I am part of the Accelerated Master's program here. You could say that the Gates Institute really propelled me forward with uh, career aspirations, college aspirations. The Institute didn't just allow you to get your feet wet and uh, fly a pilot in your ground school, but they had everything. As a young woman, being you know, a high school student, I knew women could be pilots, but it just seemed so, so far out of reach. And it wasn't until Gates Institute that it really clicked that this is something that I can, I can make a career out of doing, something that I love. 
the young women that were there with life, lifelong friendships. We still talk today. Actually, my, my best friend is from that class, and my other best friend was my flight instructor. She's actually a professor for that class as well. Having my flight instructor and friend in that role of like a mentor student type relationship, that was a huge push and motivator forward. Having my horizons push really opened my eyes to a world of possibility. My name is Jane King. I'm a research psychologist here at the Air Force Research Lab at the Wright Cox University. Growing up, I always wanted to be an astronaut, so I really loved aviation and aerospace. But after entering the Gates Institute, they kind of gave me a roadmap as to how to get there. Right now, I'm a research psychologist, and primarily I work with human autonomous aging teaming. So, really, that means that measuring human performance and how autonomous aging teams affect human performance. And I'm looking at that in multiple contexts, including rocket cargo and some space contexts, and also mission tank and aircraft combat contexts as well. I definitely think that in order to prepare me uh, for success in my career, I learned everything I know about aviation through the riddle. Um, I learned everything I know about human factors through the riddle, um, from the classwork to being able to see how the principles that are in the class actually affect real world circumstances, to conferences and job fairs, and just getting to connect with young people who have so much interest in me. Like, I think it definitely made a difference, really prepared me uh, for where I am today. And, out in the field, it's always great to run into other ARU alumni and see them doing well, so you still have that community even after you graduate. I think it's super important for young girls to see women in aviation in these STEM fields excelling and thriving because it shows them that it's possible. I would definitely credit my kind of the world and the cases to 100% what we're going to say. Isn't she awesome? Honestly, she's so inspiring. Um, but that's our presentation. And so we're happy to open it up to any questions that you might have. <sighs> Different hairstyle. <laughs> um, but we want to open up for questions, conversation, uh, sharing what you all do with the group. So any any questions? I think we have five minutes. Oh. No, that's a question. Fifteen? Ten. 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 Okay. Did you say at the beginning that it's like three million dollars a year is what you guys have to work with? So inside the state of Florida, we receive about a three million. We receive three million dollars each year um, to do basically what we're doing. Last year in in Florida, we serviced over eight thousand students. But we have programs in Illinois, Ohio, New Jersey, South Carolina, and a few other states. And we actually just were the recipients of the FAA grant. So we've got five new schools, and we're recruiting five more schools um, to participate. But, um, and that grant will help offset the cost for schools to participate. That's outside of the state of Florida. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm a uh, very excellent instructor, and I certainly support it. Step. But, but um, I'm concerned, you may be aggressive. Uh, how does this fit into the humanities? That is, the arts, uh, philosophy, and so on. As Tom Bogoresman said years ago, none of this means anything without people. None of this, I mean, the color white just got statues on it. It's a really cool looking statue right now. So, how does all this fit in with developing well-rounded people who understand? It was addressed a bit by the psychologists that are getting factors, but more broadly, all of the other things that make a well-rounded human being, a well-rounded member of society. Well, I, that's an interesting question. Um, yes, I'll just stab at it. Anybody else is willing? Because the emphasis has always been, it has been a science, technology, blah, blah, blah. But See where I'm coming from. No, I totally see where you're coming from, but I don't think you can have any of that without addressing the humanity of it all. So hold on one second. All right. Thanks, uh, Chomp. Uh, that, that actually is a good question. One of the things that we, we and we talked about the advantages of this, one of the things we really focus on is a, is a critical thinking skill. Okay? This teaches critical thinking. All right? Now, you have to have critical thinking in everything we're doing in this, especially in this industry. You know, as, as a former flight right? Critical thinking is part and parcel. But it's also something that makes them a well-rounded person in life down the road. 
if they can manage the risk, if they can kind of see what the roadblocks are ahead of them. That's all part and parcel of critical thinking. And that's what we're doing. So it does kind of flow into the other aspects of the rights. And I tell this to students all the time. One of the things I tell them is I say, you know what, you actually do critical thinking every day, you don't realize it. Or risk management. And they go, what do you mean? I say, right, think about this. If you're getting ready to go outside, you go out with your parents, and you look at the, you know, it's going to rain, what do you do? We'll get an umbrella. That's risk management, isn't it? You don't want to get wet, so how did you mitigate that risk? Getting wet, you got an umbrella. So it's showing them how risk management or how critical thinking works, and applying that every day in their lives. Again, it goes back to everything they're going to have to do in their life, because no matter what you do as, a, as, a, you know, as an adult, you're going to have to use critical thinking skills. I grant that, and I'm not trying to get into a debate. But where I'm going more is probably one of the coolest people I've seen is in uh, Facebook is a gentleman who lost for United, an uh, experienced captain. He's also one of the final panel players I've ever seen. That's the type of well roundness I'm talking about. Right. Let's see. I'm actually like Okay. Yeah. Dave is one of our um, instructors from Fair enough. So I, I, I think there might be confusion about the program. It's not taking the students away all day. This is one of their eight classes throughout the day. So our students, my students, the students, I'm up at the Chicagolander. They're still taking their foreign language, their art class. They're still involved outside. So it's one period of day. So I, I don't know if that's what well, you know, confusion there. They're, they're not being pulled away from the traditional. This is called a concurrent enrollment model. So okay. concurrent enrollment meaning it's a push-in model to the school day okay. and the school schedule and the bell schedule. And I understand I'm a supporter of this. No, 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 it's a good question. Yes? Is there a reason for the accreditation to not be because of the dual enrollment to the credit? Basically, it's, it's my program place to the credit program and similar it's basically the accreditation issue for the quiet. Right? Yeah. Yeah, the accreditation is we don't, we, there is no wiggle room there, um, with the exception of the options that we kind of showed, which is again why we created some of the high school and middle school outreach opportunities for, for schools. For specifically, uh, they do not have the dual credit option when it comes to the accreditation. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I teach uh, Air Force Junior ROTC in Washington State. Uh, and I looked into this uh, for a few years actually, and I'm just kind of curious as to how the partnership between the Air and Air Force Junior ROTC is going where we're at with that. So, our, one of our fastest growing um, programs is our J Watson program. Several years ago, we first approached, probably in 13 14, the Air Force to develop a partnership. Long story short, Navy stepped up real quick. Um, and once the Navy did amazingly, so did the Air Force JROTC. So with the Air Force and Navy JROTC, we have an agreement to basically overlay our dual enrollment opportunities on top of their coursework. The university coursework is about 37 hours of instructional time. We know on a high school campus, you're looking at 90 hours a semester of instructional time plenty of time for all the other requirements for JROTC. The learning standards and the master course objectives are very similar, which is why they've allowed it and they approved it. Um, for us, many, many times, the JROTC instructors meet the criteria for credentialing. So it was a beautiful partnership because most of our JROTC instructors have a master's degree Many of them have a master's degree in field. If they're out of field, they can attend our immersion boot camps, get an AGI, and we can prepare them to meet the criteria as long as they have that master's degree. So it was a beautiful relationship. Um, on the website, there are some, you can even pull up the JROTC page, but it'll show you a course flow. And we work with um, Dave Haynes out of uh, Winter Park High School in Central Florida, and he's our liaison for the program. Wealth of knowledge and information. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I think if you scroll down, Kate, it might show the course flow for JROTC.
Yeah, I thought we had more strong. I believe it's anyone if you're interested. Okay, um, and, uh, like I said, I did poke my nose in this couple years ago, and I have a master's degree from this kind of sketch school called Every Real Life. I don't trust this people. Not a bit. But um, funding was an issue. And so we have in our school district, in our state, we have several programs that uh, have dual enrollment in various colleges. That's primarily subsidized by the school district or whatever. And there was a challenge to make that relationship work in the long run. And so that's, you know, um, one of the difficulties that I ran into in terms of this so I'm not sure if you're talking about worldwide. There's two dual enrollment programs through the university. One is worldwide and it's online. Ours is not. It's a hands-on, in the school, in the classroom type of program. So it's a little different. I'm not sure. Um, the only thing, other thing that I will say is um, not every state, like for example, Michigan. We can't do dual enrollment in Michigan because state statute prohibits that. They are not allowed to develop dual enrollment partnerships outside of their own state college system. Other states are easy peasy, right? It's an MOU, no big deal. Other states are a little bit more complex. So that's really honestly why we have to deal with each state on a state by state basis. And basically we put in a request to our articulation department, hey, is it, for example, Washington, is Washington an easy partner to get dual enrollment approved in or not. Um, but like I said, we are, we're looking for five because we've got the FAA grant. Um, the states right now that we're in, it's just a handful outside of the state of Florida. 95% of what we do is in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for doing what you do.